in the last episode of Keys Dive Guide, we visited Marathon's Mystery Gun, an unknown shipwreck from the mid-1600s. By swimming underneath the ballast of this ancient wreck, divers are afforded a really good view of her structural timbers. Today we're going to check out the frame of another ancient ship about 50 miles up the reef line near Tavernier Creek, situated near mile marker 90.8 on the Overseas Highway. Heading out from Tavernier Creek Marina, we proceed seaward to the Tavernier Creek Headpin. From here, it's about three miles, 140 degrees southeast to our target. We're meeting legendary treasure salver Captain Carl Frederick and his research, search, and salvage dive team for a salvage dive on San Jose y Los Animas of the 1733 fleet, number four on the old chart. She's in 30 feet of water completely covered by a three to five foot sand blanket, making her an uninteresting dive site for recreational divers. San Jose was built in the New England colonies in 1728. Displacing 326 tons, she was nicknamed El Conde, or the Count. She carried 30,435 pesos in silver specie and bullion. Her manifest indicates she was heavily overburdened with a huge consignment of organic cargo. In the fury of the hurricane, San Jose was swept between Davis and Little Conk reefs. On the outside edge of Hawk Channel, her stern smashed to ground. She lumbered on for 200 yards before sinking, bow facing seaward, stern facing shoreward. Let's check out the wreck site 260 years after the disaster. The elbow-shaped device surrounding the prop of this salvage vessel is called a mailbox. The ship assumes a four-point anchor, making her immobile. Then, the captain revs up the engine of the vessel as the mailbox directs the powerful prop wash down to the ocean bottom. This blows away four feet of sand overburden that covers the oak frame of this ancient galleon. Descending on the frame of San Jose, the keelson, a support timber for the keel, is clearly visible. The keel is the main longitudinal timber of a ship and is buried in the sand a few feet beneath the keelson. Her ribs are supported by stout riders. It is clearly evident that we're in a four to five foot hole in the sandbox. The compound ribs of San Jose are composed of four to five component parts called foothooks. These support timbers are called ground foothooks or cheek piece fillers. Wooden ships were not watertight. The rougher the seas, the more water they would take on. Ancient shipwrights carved drainage passageways called limber holes in the inner bilge of a ship's frame, usually in the first foothook, close to the keel. This helped to prevent dry rot by allowing water to pass between the ribs toward the manual bilge pumps 
that remove the water from the hold of the ship. These timbers are called bilge ceiling planks or sleepers. The thick floor planks attached to the ribs that separate the inner bilge from the hold where ballast stones were added for stability. The wooden components of a ship were fastened with round wooden nails, especially in areas exposed to water. These marine nails were called trenels, a contraction of the words tree nails. Trenels would not rust or loosen like iron nails. When immersed, the wood would absorb a little water causing it to swell. This made a tight-fitting nail. Often mistakenly called the Teredo worm, the Teredo is actually a wood-boring bivalve related to clams that thrives in tropical waters. These termites of the sea will destroy the structural integrity of a ship by boring through and constructing tubes in her wooden components. It's possible that this infestation helped hasten San Jose's demise. Although no gold or silver was recovered today, a Kingside Dynasty pottery shard links San Jose with the Manila fleet, whose goods were loaded in Veracruz, Mexico, several months before she went down. The true treasure of the 1733 wreck sites is the ability to step back in time, if only for a few minutes, and explore the secrets and beauty of the grave sites these galleons picked to spend eternity, 280 years ago. San Jose will continue to sink deeper over time. After this salvage ends, a few changes of the tides will completely cover her again. Following the track of San Jose for one mile, 165 degrees south-southeast from the wreck site, one of her cannon rests in 35 feet of water. Through the years, a beautiful mound of star coral has grown on top of the cannon, which is about nine feet long and made of iron. I can imagine this cannon crashing overboard as San Jose pitched and yawed her way shoreward, sinking about one mile away. San Jose and her cannon are very close to two other shipwrecks of the 1733 fleet. In volume 20 of Key's Dive Guide, we met commercial airline pilot Mick O'Connor for dives on El Infante and La Capitana, the two other galleons that make up the silver triangle of the 1733 Armada shipwrecks. Hard hat diver Art McKee began recovering treasure from La Capitana in 1939 beginning the era of modern treasure salvage. She's situated about one mile west of Davis Reef Light Tower in 20 feet of water, completely covered by sand. Built in 1730 in Havana, Cuba, for King Philip of Spain, La Capitana was a 500-ton monster with over 60 cannon. When she exploded into the sand, she was heavily overburdened with gold, silver, organic cargo, and 225 passengers, most of whom were saved. Today, all that's left here are a few disarticulated timbers and random ballast stones. People ask me all the time, is there any treasure left on these wrecks? Mick recovered this beautiful rosary in the sand near La Capitana in early 1995. 
Sometimes a storm or even the changing tides will uncover treasure and artifacts, but for the most part, these ballast mounds were picked clean decades ago. Out of the three wrecks of the Silver Triangle, El Infante on Little Conch Reef is the best dive. Displacing 475 tons and bristling with 60 cannon, El Infante was property of the king and carried over 5 million pesos of gold and silver. Her ballast mound was over 100 feet long, 40 feet wide, and 7 feet tall when she was initially rediscovered by Art McKee in 1955. Years of salvage and human visitation have left a flattened ballast mound in a 200-foot oval on this site today. The ghostly outline of a few structural timbers, including the keelson, ribs, and forward bow frames, are the only framework left visible on El Infante today. This site map from 1990 shows a lot of exposed wood on her port side that has been carefully covered with ballast to slow the decomposition process of this rapidly deteriorating shipwreck. Her riches from the New World included indigo, cochineal, vanilla, and ceramic plates, jars, and jugs. These timbers were carefully hewn, then assembled in the shipyards of Genoa, Italy in 1724, nine years before she went down in the hurricane. We're literally diving over history. Nearby El Infante, the reefscape is spectacular. Replete with friendly marine life and beautiful corals, Little Conch Reef is one of the most underrated dive sites in the Upper Keys. There are no mooring buoys here, so be sure to anchor in sand when exploring this shallow, uncrowded coral garden. Next episode of Keys Dive Guide, we're going to explore more great dive sites in the Tavernier Creek area. We'll begin our tour on Conch Reef and dive the Horseshoe, the Conch Wall, the Aquarius Habitat, and the mysterious Granite Block Wreck. before skipping down to Captain Tom's Ledge. Then we'll hang out with the friendly eels on Davis Reef before a visit to Crocker Reef and the beautiful Crocker Wall. The 
Dive Odyssey continues tomorrow. Join us for another in-depth exploration of the Florida Keys Reef Line.